You have that CD. Thank God for our gifted worship leaders in our church and the way they bless our hearts and lead us before the Lord. And um, I'm glad you've come to church today. And, um, you know, that's for later. That's for later. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John. Only one mark today, just one. Just going to talk about one of the marks of an authentic Christian. Don't have five of them out tonight. Don't have three of them out. Not going to study two tonight. How many are we going to look at? Just one. Just one. And I want to talk to you about uh, a war that's going on. Let's uh, get the context on war. What do you know about World War I? Triggered by the assassination of an Austrian duke, World War I began in the summer of 1914. Lasted four years only. Can you believe that? Four years. More than 10 million, 10 million military casualties. Every life matters. But 10 million people died in World War I. World War II began in the fall of 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. Lasted six years. More than 37 million military and civilian casualties. Certainly on a human level, these are the two greatest world wars ever fought. These two wars involve more people, more casualties, more nations, of course, Europe, North America, Asia, Russia, Japan, so on, Italy. The highest stakes, the freedom of the Western world in the Second World War was on the line. What would the world have been like if that war had been lost? So, having said that, I would suggest something pretty outrageous, and it's this, that there's an even greater uh, war being fought at your house, in your family, in your life. The war that I want to talk about uh, today involves more places. It involves every single country on the face of the earth. Uh, It involves more people. Every human being living on this planet is in this war. It involves the highest possible stakes because casualties in this war uh, don't just go into eternity. Casualties in this war not only lose a lifetime of happiness, but they experience an eternity separated from God. If you uh, lose this war, you're not going to heaven, all right? In fact, if you lose this war habitually, continually, increasingly, uh, it gives evidence that you've never really uh, come to know uh, him whom to know is life eternal. And so, um, to make matters worse, it's a covert war. Uh, Many are not even aware that it's being fought, yet it constantly bombards our minds, depletes our joy, and devastates our family. And the war that I want to describe uh, to you, talk about, study from God's Word, is mentioned right here uh, in the next verses in our study of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, not a lot of verses tonight, but this is probably the most concentrated teaching in all of Scripture on this subject And so I don't want to rush by these verses. I told you at the outset that I wasn't sure exactly when we were going to finish this study. I was just going to kind of let the Lord lead, and and, uh, I don't want to rush past uh, these three verses. Uh, The title of the message uh, today is Winning the War uh, Over Worldliness, and it is a war. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world's passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God has eternal life. Whoever does the will of God and wins the war over worldliness in their life gives evidence that they've been marked by the gospel. Gives evidence that they are living an authentic Christian life. This is one of the marks. Winning the war increasingly over worldliness. All right. Let's start into verse 15, verse A. We're just going to take it a phrase at a time and a word at a time. All in favor of being fed by God's word? All right. And so I didn't make this up. I didn't sit in my office and go, what should I talk on this week? I've prepared a new talk for the church. All right? This is a message from God's Word. 
Start in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 15. Do not love the world. Do not love it. Jot this down. Worldliness is the enemy of holiness. And they're just opposites. Worldliness is the enemy of holiness. Worldliness is the opposite of holiness. Worldliness is the opposite of authentic Christian living. It's just the opposite. It's not off by nine degrees. It's not off by, you know, 34 degrees. It's the opposite. What is it? It's the opposite. It's great to be back here. I was preaching some places this week. People don't know how to, they just, I love you guys. What is it again? It's the, thank you, thank you. The word world, let's take a little overview. I kind of like to know what kind of word I'm going to study. I'm going to spend a whole message on it. The word world is used 250 times in the New Testament. Can you believe that? And it has three meanings. So you've got to know which world we have in mind here. Sometimes the, uh, the word world means uh, the planet, the earth. Like Acts 17, 24 says, God who made the world and everything in it. It's talking about the planet and, and it's talking about the animals and the plants and, and the physical creation. But sometimes when the, word world uses, when the Bible uses the word world, sometimes it doesn't mean the planet. Sometimes it means the people. Any, anybody think of an example in the New Testament uh, where the Bible uses the word world, but it doesn't mean the planet, it means the people. I love when you can get the, I said, I'm going to give, I always wanted to be a teacher and I would give the easiest tests, I'm sure. That was a pretty easy, easy question. John 3, 16, for God so loved the, did that mean that he loves the planet? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if he loves the planet. That text doesn't teach that. It's definitely not talking about God's love for, you know, the lions and the elephants and, and so on. It's talking that God loves the people on the planet. But sometimes when the Bible uses the word world, it's not talking about the planet or the people. Sometimes when the Bible uses the word world, it's talking about the world system. The world system. For example, in Mark 4, 19, when it says that the cares of this world choke the word and you become unfruitful. That's one of the things that happens here at Harvest every week. I preach the word, you listen, you agree, you go out of here, you get on your cell phone, and before 15 minutes goes by or 15 hours goes by, the cares of this world choke the word out of your life and it becomes unfruitful. I wasted my time this week. I went to church, I loved it, I agreed with it, and then I, I forgot it. What happened? The cares of this world choked the word out of your life. That's going to happen to some people here tonight, without question. Happens every day, every Sunday morning, every Saturday night. The cares of this world choked the word. Here, here's a great scripture. In John chapter 1, verse 10, the word world is used three times, and it uses it each of the different kinds. Listen to this. John 1, 10, Jesus was in the world... That's the system. And the world was made by him. That's the planet. And the world knew him not. That's the people. Okay. Now, when you get over here to 1 John chapter 2, and it says, do not love the world. I don't mean to belabor this, but I think it's pretty obvious that it's not talking about don't love the planet. It's not talking about don't go to the beach. It's talking about don't go mountain climbing. It's not talking about that. And... 1 Timothy 6, 17 says that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. It's not wrong to love to go for a walk at the forest preserve. And it's not, wasn't it a beautiful day today? Wasn't it a beautiful day? And, and we, we've had some rough weekends here with rain and so on. And just so enjoying these days here, these fleeting days of, of a beautiful weather. And it's not wrong to enjoy that. And it's not wrong to love to be outside and to love the outdoors. That's not what the Bible's talking about. That can be too much. It can be an excess. But that's not what the Bible's talking about when it says don't love the world. It's not talking about the planet. And I think I don't have to spend a lot of time uh, proving to you when the Bible says don't love the world that it's not talking about the people. Okay? And, and uh, many times in Scripture we're told to love one another. And, and we're learning that one of the marks of a Christian is that they love deeply. The greatest commandment is that you would love one another, Jesus said, as I've loved you. And, and we do love one another, amen? And that's such an important thing for us. And so clearly, when he says in 1 John 2, he's not talking about don't love the planet. He's not talking about don't love the people. Everybody with me? Okay. He's clearly talking about don't love the world system. Don't love it. Don't love the world system. Let's see if we can get a kind of a definition of that uh, here. 
The world system, actually, world, we, we, that's a term that we use to describe any organized system of people or ideas. Any organized system of people or ideas or activities. Um, there used to be a program I would watch every Saturday afternoon. I can still hear the music. I can still see the guy coming down the ski jump and flipping out. It was called Wide World of... All right? That's not talking about the people. That's not talking about the planet. It's talking about an organized system of activities. The world of sports. Ladies and gentlemen, we join now in the world of sports. Everyone understands that. The world of sports. The world of politics. Uh, the world of finance. We've been hearing uh, an awful lot about. And I'll say more about. It's any organized system. All right? Now, the world in the Bible, the world system in the Bible, it belongs to Satan. You need to understand that. There's a world system out there. It's an organized system of thinking. It has a certain list of activity, activities that it prescribes. It has a certain way of thinking that it lays out for people. There, there's a whole thing called the world. We're all so aware of it. If, if you're aware of it, go like this. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the world system and everything that goes with it. And when he says, well, this will help, the world is Satan's system for opposing the work of Christ on earth. That's what it is. 1 John 5, 19, Jesus said, the, wor the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He wasn't talking about the planet. He definitely wasn't talking about the people. He was saying the whole world system lies under the control of the evil one. In fact, Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. And again, he meant the world system. Unsaved people, uh, Jesus called them in Luke 16, uh, Jesus called them the sons of this world. Unsaved people. They are card-carrying members of the world system. In fact, uh, true believers in Jesus Christ, I hope you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. I hope this series is helping you come to a greater confidence that you've been marked by the gospel increasingly, amen? And, and uh, one of the things uh, that you should know and be aware of is, is that believers are hated by this world system. Do you understand that? That as you bear increasingly the five marks of an authentic Christian, all right, as you bear those increasingly in your life, you, you are hated by the world. And you know what Jesus has to say about you being hated by the world system? He's like, me first. In fact, John 15, 8, Jesus said, if the world hates you, he's like, it hated me first. All right? and, and, and the world hates you because of your allegiance to me. All right? Isn't that the whole thing about the signs? Got a whole bunch more sign stories this week. I think I'll save them for next week. Um, I think all I want to say about the sign stories is, is if, if, if your uh, municipality is telling you to take down your sign, or like one person who wrote me this week, and they just come out and took the sign right off their lawn. All right, well, we're posting on the internet the letter that I wrote to a municipality and the letter that our attorney sent them about our constitutional rights. And all I can tell you is when they get that letter, not only do they bring the sign back, but they offer to plant a flower bed around it. And, and so, so trust me on this one, all right? Just go to the website, get the letter. They'll have your sign back in about 10 minutes, okay? But why the heavy reaction? Why? Not because they hate you. Be, be, it, it's Jesus said that they hate me and who I am and what I stand for. And you line your life up, you, you get a sign on your lawn, you get the flag to the top of the pole, and all of a sudden some people that thought you were just fine and dandy are going to come out against you. Now, I don't want to be obnoxious, but I don't want to be ashamed. That was a great spot for an amen. I don't want to be obnoxious, but I... I I don't want to be ashamed before the sons of this world. And so when he says, do not love the world, what he's saying is, do not have affection for it. Do not be devoted to it. Do not prioritize it, the world. <laughs> do not love the world or anything in the world. Anything in the world is part of the world system. Don't love it. You can have it. It just can't have you. Do you get it? Okay. So as you were thinking through this whole week about my stuff, my pension, I know I don't have a ton of money in my pension, but I heard today that the company that it's in is kind of like, I don't know what will happen. I don't love it. 
I don't love it. God help us not to love the things in this world. Having, fine. Don't let it have you. The Bible says if riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Don't have your love tied up in things of this world. So we surveyed 100 people, top five, 10 even. Answers are on the board to this question. Name some things in the world that Christians struggle not to love. Ding, money, number one answer. Number two, travel. Number three, hobbies. Do you have some hobbies that you love? Do you love your hobbies? Do you love them? Oh, I love my hobbies. I love them. He just mouthed to me, golf. You love my golf clubs. I love my golf balls. I love my golf course. I love my golf friends. Enjoy, fine. Love, no. Don't ever say that you love that or any hobbies. Do you love sports? Do you love sports? Did you come to church at this service so that you won't miss the start of the Bears game? <laughs> Fine, 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 fine. Enjoy the Bears game. Don't love it. I can't wait for the playoffs in baseball. Can't wait. That sounded pretty loving to me. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But for now... Don't love, not money, not travel, not hobbies, not sports, not entertainment. My wife and I, we just love to go to the movies. Enjoy, fine. Don't ever have to, don't ever need to, don't love the things in the world. Sports, uh, entertainment, uh, substances, food. Do, do you love food? This has been a good uh, year for me for getting uh, kind of on top of food. I felt like food was getting on top of me. And, and I've been getting on top of it. And, and we don't want to love anything in that sense. Food, alcohol. I, I personally believe in total abstinence. I have for my whole life. But I, I don't preach total abstinence as something the Bible requires of you. But I'll tell you, there's a great danger in loving alcohol. There are people whose day is not complete without the numbing effect of alcohol. It's part of the world system. It brings devastation to people's lives. Don't love it. Don't be a connoisseur of it. It's part of the world system. Exercise and fitness. You, you can love that. Stuff, things, the next thing, garage sales, bigger, faster, better. You can love your career. You can love it. It's part of the world system. You can love position and influence. Notice in all of these things, there's just a quick list to give you an idea of the kind of things I'm talking about that we all have to battle. Notice that worldliness is not action sin, okay? Worldliness isn't something you do, okay? Worldliness is not like immorality and deception. You liar. You cheater. Worldliness is not like um, uh, stealing. Give that back. It's not like that. It's, it's not like gossip. Shut, shut your mouth. Okay, it's not like that. It's not action sin. Worldliness is, is attitude sin. Things not inherently evil, except as they crowd out better things. That's the world. I, I really meant to do this, but I got so caught up in the world, I, I never got the things done I wanted to get done. That's the world got that. God in your way. The worldly Christian is not overtly rebellious. The worldly Christian does not have a scarlet letter on their forehead. The worldly Christian does not have a prolonged addiction or an overt wickedness. In fact, for the most part, you can't even tell a worldly Christian to see one. I wouldn't have no idea. Are you a worldly Christian? Are, are you one? I have absolutely no idea if this is a battle that's going on in your life. Worldliness is an attitude, as we've learned many years. Uh, an attitude is a pattern of thinking formed over a long period of time. And it's very subtle, really, the way that worldliness uh, uh, colors and uh, clutters your life. I thought I'd kind of use this water they put up here all the time for me as an illustration. 
Worldliness is kind of like this. It's kind of like, here, hold this for me. Hold this. All right, hold it out this way, like that. It's higher. Now you're doing great. We're, if this is me and this is my heart, set free and forgiven, clean and pure before Christ, worldliness is kind of like this. You know, and it just kind of uh, colors me, and the more I put into it, uh, the more it colors me, and it, it, it can come to the point where there's really no difference in me compared to what is in the world. It's just, it's not different. It's just not. And, and I want to I tell you, how hard would it be to get that back to its original form? It, it would be terrifically difficult to get that back to its original form. I mean, how, how would you even go about doing that? And yet so many of our lives are, are, are so flooded with worldliness. In fact, it may pose the greatest danger of all to genuine biblical Christianity. Let's break it down a little bit. Here's a, here's a good heading. Worldliness means, worldliness is when I'm allowing my desires to control me. All right? We all have desires. We're going to talk about those in a moment. It's right here in 1 John 2. We all have desires. All right? And worldliness is when my desires begin to control me and dictate my life. Notice that he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. I'll come back to the end of verse 15, uh, f- the end of verse 15 in a moment. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, here it is, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride in possessions. Let's take those one at a time. Now, first of all, uh, the desires of the flesh. That, that's physical desires. Physical desires. For all that is in the world, first of all, the physical desires. Um, the desires of the flesh. Some translations say the lust of the flesh. When I grew up uh, hearing preaching, the preacher would talk about the lust of the flesh. The problem with that is, is that lust now has such a sexual connotation that we think he's talking just about that exclusively, which he's not. That the lust of the flesh is far more uh, than than sexual temptation. NIV translates it cravings. I think the ESV is a great translation here. It's the desires. It's what I want. I want what I want. If you've ever had that thought, why are you doing that? I want it. That's a good chance. That's the desires of your flesh. Now, the word flesh in the Bible, we just stop on that for a moment. Taking this a word at a time. Are you with me? All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh. I want to help you understand that concept in case it's not familiar to you. Your flesh is your old nature, all right? Someone told me a long time ago, if you want to understand flesh, I thought this was clever, cross out the H at the end of the word and then spell it backwards. Cross out the H and spell it backwards. What do you get? That's the flesh. It's me. It's what I want. It's me on the throne, me in charge, me calling the shots. My physical wants and desires, my flesh, the old nature, it's the sin nature. It's your inclination to do wrong. Hey, can you handle it that you have an inclination to do wrong? Are you going to get all mad at me and up in my face just because I tell you? You have an inclination to do wrong. Do you know it? Do you know it? Okay, left to yourself, you will make a rotten choice most of the time. Sorry to have to tell you that. Say, well, you will too. Thank you, correct. Correct. All right? It's called the lust of the flesh. It's my old nature. Let me ask you, which is easier, to hate or to love? Do we agree? Hating, yeah, I never worked at that. Took no seminars on it, heard no teaching on it. Can't remember one time I listened, you gotta get this tape on hating, man. It makes it so easy. <laughs> no, and you couldn't sell a book like that. Everyone knows how to do that. Love is what's hard. Which is easier? Taking or giving? You say, well, I love to give. Yeah, you might love to give so much because of what you take from it when you give. Really giving with no expectation of anything in return for no reward of any kind. It's hard to find that. Hard to do that. Hating is easier than loving. Taking is easier than giving. Which is easier, indulgence or discipline? Because I have a Krispy Kreme donut right here. (laughs) Which would be easier, to give it to you or eat it myself? 
Well, of course the answer is always and in every case, self-indulgence is way, way easier than discipline. Walking past the refrigerator, refusing to hang up the phone, turning off the television. I won't read that. I don't look at those things. Turning away from the world is cr incredibly difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is because I have this thing called my flesh. It's my old nature. It's a sinful anchor around me that drags me down. My flesh. Now, you need to know the, Bi the Bible has nothing good to say about your flesh. Okay? Um, I could just give you a couple things here. In Romans chapter 7, it says that in your flesh dwells no good thing. In John chapter 6, it says the flesh profits nothing. In Philippians chapter 3, it says put no confidence in your flesh. In Romans chapter 13, it says make no provision for your flesh. All right, the Bible has nothing good to say about your flesh. Now, before Christ, what I want to satisfy myself, I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. And that means the old, the flesh, is gradually passing away. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Every Christian should have this memorized. If anyone is in Christ, if you're in Christ today, all right, the old is passing away and the new is coming. Gradually, bit by bit, the world's grip on you is being released. Gradually, bit by bit, your love for the things of God, your passion for the things of God, it's growing in you authentically, all right? That's the mark of a true Christian. Desires are not wrong, though. It's important to understand that. It broke my heart. I'm going to tell you more in a moment. I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania last night preaching at a Walk in the Word event and a 10th anniversary for one of our Harvest Affiliate churches, a wonderful church that's already planted three churches and, and, and it's so exciting. And uh, it kind of broke my heart. A man waited in line after me, a very distinguished, handsome-looking African-American man, I found out he was a pastor. I have to talk to you. Apparently he had called to talk to me and wanted to talk to me and, and, and um, took me aside and, and uh, poured out a story to me that broke my heart. He had been told a lot of things about um, a particular area of struggle in his life that were not true. And even though he knew what the Word of God said, he couldn't get free from, from, from a mixed up idea about desires. He thought that the desiring itself was wrong. And I wanna be really clear about that. Take for example, uh, four physical desires. Take for example, hunger. Hunger, right or wrong? Right. But when it becomes gluttony, wrong. Uh, thirst, A plus. But when it becomes alcoholism, wrong. Uh, sleep. But when it becomes laziness, it's wrong. A sex. But when it becomes immorality, when it becomes be outside of the boundary of marriage. See, Satan's system is to take the good things that God created and to twist them. To, to either make you feel guilty about the right things, or more often to drag you off into the excesses where the right becomes wrong. Outside of God's boundaries. Getting you to color outside the lines. And worldliness is the attitude that leads to the action of sin. Physical desires. That's the first part. The desires of the flesh. Here's the second part. The desires of the eyes. Again, these are not three, hear me on this. These are not three different kinds of worldliness. Okay, he's like, oh, well, I'm kind of a lust of the flesh guy. No, that's not the point at all, all right? W what it is is three access points to the human heart, all right? The same sins, the same struggles, but they come in a different way. One appeals to you physically. Another one appeals to you uh, through your eyes. Now, if you've ever said to somebody, feast your eyes on this, then you know what the desires of the eyes are. How much sin comes in through the gate of our eyes? David said, I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. And it's the desire to see that causes so much worldliness and leads to so much sin. The spiritual life is rooted in faith, not sight. Walking with God is all about not seeing. All right? And, and walking in the flesh and being a person of this world, if you're one of the people that says, i got to see it, man. It's not real till I see it. That's not going anywhere good. 
not, not eternally, not spiritually speaking. Worldliness is allowing what I see to control me. You go to the grocery store. You go to the magazine rack. You get on the internet alone. You go to a shopping mall. You turn on the television, the greatest inflamer of the desires of the eyes ever invented is the television. And, and the capacity to have... Has anybody here ever just ordered something and then when it got to your house and like three weeks later it was in the basement, then it was in the garage and you're like, why did I order that for? I was sitting in my living room, I didn't even know I wanted that, but all of a sudden I was on the phone and I ordered it and it was such nonsense and, I, and, and what happened? Your TV did that, okay? It got, it got your eyes all fired up about something that you thought you had to have. Worldliness is allowing what I see to control me. Now, I want to talk about two extremes here that I've mentioned uh, in years gone by. One extreme is legalism, and one extreme is license, all right? I got a firsthand view of, uh, of legalism uh, being in Lancaster County uh, yesterday in Pennsylvania. Anybody ever been there? Big time Amish country, big time Amish country. So always a perplexing thing to me, the, these Amish people. Um, they're actually uh, historically Anabaptists rooted in the 16th century from Switzerland. They came to Pennsylvania in 1730. Jacob Amman was the founder of the Amish, and he started uh, his sect uh, because the group that he was worshiping with would not excommunicate members who were living in sin. And uh, they take Romans chapter 12's use of the word world as kind of their main verse. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the image of this world. Okay. And so the Amish have some really <laughs> perplexing ideas about uh, what the world is. They gave me this hat last night when I got up to speak. I thought they, th they, think they thought I would think it was really cool. Um, I'm Amish. <laughs> and and uh, driving down the road and seeing these Amish people, it's, it's so perplexing. Like they have all these rules. Like for example, um, they're allowed to have buttons and clasps on their clothing but not zippers, because that's worldly. And they're not allowed to drive tractors. I laughed because I was driving down the road and there was this guy out here in the field with these, these horses, but behind him he's pulling like a 28 row disker that must have cost thousands. I'm like, okay, the tractor's not worldly, but the, I, just, I find it really perplexing, you know? And, and they have all these, 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 these like, like we were leaving after I was done preaching and there was these buggies going down the road. It was very dark out. And, and of course, they, they couldn't have a motor car, so they got the horse pulling the buggy, but then they got this massive spotlight on the front of the thing. And I'm like, okay, you can't have the light, but you can't have the motor. Like, is anyone confused? Like, like, who made all this stuff up? Okay. And yet, Paul said in, to the Corinthians, do not exceed what is written. Do not exceed what is written. And, and uh, I don't think we can really... Um, make much time on the Amish people. I think the evangelical church is filled with rules that aren't in the Bible. Things that we get all amped about and, and, and attitudes that we cop with one another about things that are not explicitly stated, all right? Anybody who tries to put something on you that is not explicitly stated in the Bible, that's legalism. Anyone who tries to judge you by something, now look, look, sisters, okay, if it's written, then we're gonna have to deal with it, okay? But if it's not written, step away from the vehicle. Okay? And, and just what the Bible says, just what the Bible says, everything it says without apology and nothing else that it doesn't say. Then just grace and forbearance with one another. Does that make sense? All right? Anything other than that's legalism. But I got to tell you, the vast majority of us are, are not remotely close to the world of legalism. Our problem is not legalism, our problem is now the other extreme uh, called license. License is where we don't think there's any rules at all. We, we don't even hardly admit that God's prescribed a way to live. We, we don't have any uh, uh, accepted standards between us. This is what a Christian should look at. This is what a Christian should not look at. If, if every person in this room had to get up and exit now, if they've looked at uh, a sexual acts or, or uh, uh, filmed nudity in the last year, how many people would be left in the room? And yet, yet, who could really defend that as something that someone who's not of this world ought to be putting into their mind? I could, I could give so many examples of that. God help all of us. It's a war that's going on. And, and it's, a, it's a world system that is trying to capture us. 
through our physical desires, through our visual desires. Here's one, positional desires. That's what he means when he says, for all that is in the world, three categories, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride in possessions. That's a difficult phrase to translate. The Bible, um, Bibles translate this a lot of ways. Pride of life, boastful pride of life, life of empty show, boasting of what man has and does. Um, the boasting there is the arrogant braggart who, who uh, can't wait to trumpet what he has or, or what he's accomplished. That's worldliness, the person who can't wait to tell you. Do you know where I work? Let me tell you about my career. Let me tell you what happens when I go to work and the number of people who, and, and just can't wait to tell you what they've accomplished. And the, I had the corner office and, and, and I had glass all around me and I had so many, I could pick up the phone. You, that, that's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about positional desires, the pride of life, the insatiable need to feel important, accomplishment, association. I think when I look at the list, I think that this is definitely the one that challenges me. I think I would want you to be honest about which is hard for you the physical desires, the visual desires. I'm not a stranger to those worldly temptations. But I'm certainly a person who wants to accomplish. The Bible says, do you seek great things? Seek them not for yourself. It's not wrong to be ambitious. It's not wrong to be ambitious for God's kingdom. But we must make sure that we're not ambitious for God's kingdom for ourselves. Do you struggle with this? Here's some good questions to ask yourself. I wrote down three. They were pretty convicting for me, so I thought I'd share them with you. Do I desire position or do I desire impact? Which, which do I want? Do I want to be seen or do I want to influence? Because to see lives changed and impacted, to, to, uh, whether it be in the marketplace or, or in a position like I have or through your ministry here in the church, it's not wrong to aspire. I was encouraging one of our pastors this week that he aspires to greater leadership. That's not wrong. Do you seek great things? Seek them not for yourself. Do I desire position or impact? Second question. Do I pride myself on who I know? This is, this is something that has really laid me out. I, I have been personally deeply convicted by this. I'm not sure how this happened uh, exactly. But sometime in the last, I, I guess probably in the last 10 years, people that I would have 15 years ago or 20 years ago listed as my heroes have become my friends. And it's been really hard not to get a sense of your own something from the people that you know. It's really hard when you're among peers not to say, well, I was talking to so-and-so on the phone the other day, or, or I'm going to be going to meet with this person, and, and, and um, <laughs> some of you are like, who are you talking about? Oh, I can't wait to tell you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? People drop names, and I know so-and-so. God forgive us for that. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the light, and pride, pride. Here's one. Do I react negatively, viscerally, with anger when, when people put me down? When I feel like my rights are being trampled? Do, 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 does, this, does this happen to anyone else? If you feel like someone violates you, like, okay, so here's one. So I was at the airport the other day. This is a few weeks ago now. And um, is this TSA thing and all the security, is that like getting on anyone else's nerves or just me? Don't leave me up here. Does anyone else find that even a little bit aggravating? When, when they, when they, so we're, Kathy and I were going somewhere. I don't remember where we were going anymore. And we're standing there in the line. It was moving slowly, you know, but I understand that. I'm sure these people have the hardest job in the world. I mean, really, honestly, I try for the most part to encourage them because it's not a great job. Nobody's super happy about having to take their shoes off because some guy tried to, didn't some guy try to put a bomb in his shoes like 15 years ago? That guy should be in the corner of the airport. He should have to take his shoes on and off for the rest of his life 24-7. <laughs> yeah, there's that guy. See, that's why he's there. 
So anyway, we're taking our shoes off, and you know, and, and they come out and they scream at you, uh, "Put your laptop in a bin by itself!" They're like, "Yeah, I've heard that just about ten thousand times." You have any liquids? They're more than uh, they're just screaming at you, and this went on and on. And so, like, they, I got we got the whole speech. Well, I don't know what was going on, but they got in a loop where they couldn't get out of it. And like about 30 seconds later, someone else came out and said, put your laptops in. This one. And then like about 30 seconds later, someone else came out and made the same speech again. And then within two minutes, the first guy came back. I lost it. I was like, we're, we were all here for the first speech. We heard the whole thing. We got it. We got it. We're the same people. We're the same people. We've heard this. Take a break. So Kathy had to post bail. <laughs> no, you... What's my problem? What's my problem? The pride of life. It's the pride of life. I don't want to be treated like that. I don't want to be talked to like that. And you feel something welling up inside you. Is that the spirit? Or is that the flesh? Is that the new me? Or is that the old me? See, that's worldliness. And one of the marks on our life is, is that increasingly these things are not happening to us. And, and when they do happen, we're grieved by it and we know we're wrong. And, and, and that's what living authentically and being marked by the gospel is about. So worldliness is when I allow my desires to control me. Physical desires, visual desires, positional desires. I could show you how the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are all in the Garden of Eden. When the woman saw that it was good, food, that was the desire of her flesh. And when it was, it was a delight to her eyes, that was the desire of the eyes. And it was desirable to make one wise, there's the pride of life. Same thing with Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The desires of the flesh. Command these stones to be, aren't you hungry? Make some bread. The desire of his flesh. And then he took him up into a high temple and he showed him everything and he said, all these kingdoms will be yours. I'll give them to you. If you worship me, Satan said to the Lord, the desire of his eyes. Throw yourself down from the temple. God will rush in and save you. You're very important. Hasn't he given thousands of angels to watch over you? The pride of life. Adam and Eve faced it. Jesus Christ faced it. And this has been snapping at our heels all week, hasn't it? This is what has really helped me. Jot this down. Turn the page. Worldliness displaces Father love. These two things can't coexist. That's why he says at the end of verse 15, if anyone loves the world, the Greek tense there means if anyone loves the world habitually, I want to really encourage you with this because there can't possibly be a person listening to this message right now who's like, yeah, this is so not a problem for me. I mean, I'm glad I came and stuff like that, but he missed me 100% this week. <laughs> You're really disconnected. I just can't believe anyone's even thinking that. All right? Because notice how it says, the tense is habitually, which it means if the course or the pattern of your life is loving the world. If you can't see a decreasing love for the world and an increasing love for God, you've got to ask yourself, are you really marked by the gospel? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. World love and Father love cannot coexist. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. James said a double-minded person is unstable in all of their ways. So... Those worldly desires, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the uh, pride, uh, the desires, the prideful uh, desire of life. ESV says pride in possessions. I think it's more than that. Notice how he says at the end of verse, all of these things, all of them, they're not from God. They're from the world. Do you get that? All of those things, they're not from God. All the things I've been talking about for the whole message, they're not from God. Just turn to your neighbor and say, they're not from God. Okay? All that stuff that you battle with looking at, all that's the pride that, that wells up inside us and, 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 and desires to, to, to set things right. My flesh, what I want, is not from the Father, it's from the world. 
But true father love can displace, this is the opposite, true father love can displace world love. I was coming into church tonight. I haven't seen this because I don't hardly ever drive on 53 by the church. How many people actually go on 53 to get to church? I'm curious. Put up your hand if you go on 53 to get to the church. So about half the people. Well, apparently when you're driving up 53 right now, there's this big authentic Jesus billboard. But if you look at it at the right angle, on either side is a big diamond jewelry ad. I thought that's kind of nicely placed, right? Okay, you can go for the, you can go for the jewelry, or you, and, and Jesus right in the center of it. It reminded me of uh, Matthew 13. I'm just going to read that to you. Matthew 13, uh, verse 45 and 46. Let me read it to you. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. See, that, that's, what, that's what father love is. Uh, being a follower of Jesus Christ is when you're willing to give up everything that you have for the one thing. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Jesus is the one who becomes everything to us so that these other things become less and less. Look, I just hate the thought, look up here for a sec, that you would listen to a message like this and you'd be like, yeah, I gotta make myself not wanna see things. I gotta, I gotta make sure next time I'm going through the airport that I, I stuff down what I really feel when people trample on my rights. I gotta make sure from now on that, that I, don't, I don't want to have, I'm gonna make myself, that, that is not it, that is not it, that is not it, okay? Father love displaces worldly love. It's the loving of God and the, the treasure of the pearl of great price that displaces the desire for these things. And you, and you just look, and this has been my experience increasingly, that it's just like, meh. It's just, the things don't matter anymore. I mean, I can't believe how things don't matter anymore. And it just, it just I, I, was, I told you already, I was watching the news this week in the economy, and I, I was praying for people in our church, especially for people who were worried about losing their job. I prayed about that a lot this week. But I, I look at the little bit that I have and I just think, well, eh. In fact, I was flying in a plane recently and there was so much turbulence that the plane like dropped like 200 feet. Now when I was young and that used to happen, I'd be like, ah, my life! I gotta tell you, lately, when that happens, and it's like, and I'm like, eh. eh, I could go now. I could go right now. Does anyone else feel like that? The more you love the Father and the less you love the world, you're just like, meh, I could go right now. I could go right now. Worldliness displaces Father love, but true Father love, the opposite. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, but if anyone loves the Father, the love of the world is not in him. Here's his reason, verse 17. And then we're going to go to the Lord's table together. The world is passing away along with its desires. See, there's the key. Worldliness is living for momentary pleasure. That's what it is. Worldliness is living for momentary pleasure. It's passing away. Everything that's in the world's passing away. Your looks are passing away. Your finances are passing away. Your, 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 your career readiness is passing away. You've you got, got, got to get a refresher. Everything's passing away. Everything's getting older. Everything. To live for it, it's so temporary. It's so temporary. It's passing away. Worldliness is living for momentary pleasure, and lastly, holiness is living for lasting pleasure. He who does the will of God abides forever. The will of God is the word of God. Obedience to scripture is authentic Christian living. And he who does the will of God lives forever. Not just heaven someday, but a phenomenal life here and now. Holiness is living for lasting pleasure. Doing the will of God, abiding forever. Well, why don't you bow with me in a word of prayer and let's look into our hearts and ask God to purify them. There's not a person here who doesn't feel the pull of the world. And we won't be free from it as long as we're in this world. But increasingly, the love of the Father displaces the love of the world. Temporary things, human things, horizontal things, empty things, even things that are not wrong. 
We can have our heart purified from those things. We can have increasingly the love of the Father. We're going to go to the Lord's table now, and I want to encourage you just to use the remaining moments of this service as a time of personal reflection. I'm going to say very little. We're going to sing, but I don't want you to stand. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to pray, pray. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this remembrance is for you. But use the remaining moments to hold a mirror up to yourself. Do I bear the mark of a Christian? Increasingly authentic, more and more free from the world. Servers come.